This webinar was recorded on the 1st of July 2016. It features myself, Darrell O'Brien from Castlebridge, and Tim Turner from 2040 Training in the UK, discussing GDPR and Brexit and the implications for organisations in the UK and organisations in the wider European Union and beyond. We joined the webinar as Tim is just wrapping up introducing himself because I was so carried away with the wonderful team we put together for this webinar that I forgot to hit record in time. Uh, but since then I've been a data protection officer uh, in various uh, organizations but for quite a long time now as well, uh, well I've been a trainer and consultant and for the last five years full-time training and, and, and providing consultancy to anyone who'd like the assistance. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dara O'Brien. Um, I am considered by some people to be a, a leading expert in data protection law and practice in Ireland. Um, I worked for about 12 years in a leading telco here, responsible for single view of customer implementation, enterprise integration. And when I annoyed IT enough, they, they, I was shuffled off into regulatory and uh, ended up doing exactly the same things from a data perspective, uh, but with different types of data. And I work with organizations like the Irish Law Society on syllabus development, and we work very closely with public and private sector organizations to help them implement privacy on the ground, not just tick box approaches to, uh, to, to compliance. And that's where can the Brexit issues become uh, very real for a lot of organizations because we've become really comfortable in Ireland doing business with the UK and uh, the, the data protection implications of Brexit in that context are potentially significant. So uh, yeah, we've been doing this for, uh, I've been out of the phone company for uh, seven years this year. Um, so we've been trugging along for about the same length of time as Tim. So running order, we're going to talk about the Brexit process, about what we know. And this is one of the key difficulties is we actually don't know a lot about what the process actually needs to be. There's a lot of debate about that at the moment. We're going to walk through that a little bit. Um, we're going to talk about the implications of Brexit internally in the UK from a data protection perspective. We're going to talk about the implications for EU organizations, organizations in other EU countries doing business with the UK. And then I'm going to try and give you some pointers about key things you can do now uh, to manage and mitigate the risks that will be arising uh, in the context of, of the transition that's going to be under, underway over the next few years. Uh, and we're going to try and be pragmatic about it. Um, I think to, you'd agree that there's an awful lot of fear, uncertainty and doubt at the moment and we just need to try and keep focused on what are the practical, tangible things we can actually do. Okay, so the Brexit process. What happens next? Well, well this is the process that we have based on the, the, the flow. We've had the referendum vote. Um, and that, that was a surprise. This, this day last week was uh, a bit of a shock when we woke up to realize that the, the bookies had gotten it wrong. The next step in the process is that Article 50 of the Treaty for the Functioning of the European Union has to be invoked, which is the exit mechanism uh, article. And uh, I, I use the, the picture of John Hurt's war doctor there very advisedly because there is a, a large red button that has to be pressed. And until that red button is pressed by the UK government, nothing happens. So that red button may never be pressed or it could be pressed tomorrow. And the mechanism by which it can be pressed is somewhat open to debate at the moment in the UK. Um, it would appear from some commentators that an act of parliament will be required, other commentators saying perhaps not. So it's a, a bit of a, a constitutional mess, but the key thing we do know is that no matter how big or how bad the mess is, the entity that initiates the Article 50 process has to be the United Kingdom, no matter what whinging or pressure or peer pressure or comments are made by other EU member states or EU officials, this is a decision that the UK government has to make. Once that red button is pressed, there's a two-year window during which the terms of the exit are negotiated. And uh, as the EU Commissioner for Trade said last night on the BBC, the negotiation of what happens after the exit happens after the negotiations for the exit have concluded. Uh, so there's uh, a lot of uncertainty about what the timeline would be before we'd know 
what the structures would be after an exit. But there's a two-year window to negotiate that 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 leaving process. It's it's kind of like a a long, slow, messy breakup um, where we decide who gets custody of the cat and things like that. Um, if at the end of that two-year window there isn't an agreement on the structure of the exit, well, that can be extended by a unanimous vote um, of EU member states. And if during that two-year window there is resolution and clarity on what the exit mechanism is and what the exit agreement is, then that can be less than two years. Once that's all agreed, the European Parliament will give authority to the European Council of Minister, the European Council to approve the terms, and then the exit will begin at that point. Uh, after that, uh, re-entry to the EU would require reapplication as an accession state. So if the U UK changed, changed its mind uh, and had, had, had leavers regret two year, a year or two after leaving, uh, they would have to reapply and join the queue behind countries such as um, uh, Turkey. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but the UK would have a much better chance of getting into the getting back into the EU than Turkey would have at this stage. So that's the general timeline. Um, key point is there needs to be something initiated uh, by the UK government before to, to trigger the Article 50 mechanism. Now, my personal view is, on whether Article 50 will be invoked is informed by Father Ted and Terry Pratchett. Terry Pratchett wrote in one of his books that if you put a large switch in some cave somewhere with a sign on it saying end of the world switch, please do not touch, the paint won't even have time to dry, and we all remember that wonderful episode of Father Ted where Dougal calls the plane to crash uh, by pressing the big red button that said, do not press. This is unfortunately human nature. And I think we need to be hopeful that mature minds will restrain those impulses uh, that we all have for self-destruction uh, in, 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 the, in the parliament uh, as this is being voted on or and being debated. But the question of when the Article 50 uh, mechanism will be initiated is, 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 is very much open for debate. And my personal view and fear is that now that it's out there, somebody may in, be, begin the process of initiating that. And we just need to uh, hope that there's enough people to pull them back from pressing that end of the world switch. There's no formal format for the Article 50 request to be sent to the European Commission. Uh, it's just a formal communication. And again, this is one of the areas of debate, whether it needs to be uh, an act of parliament, which then creates the authorization for the UK government to, to notify the commission of its exit, or whether there's similar mechanism. But apparently David Cameron has been really, really careful about how he's finishing phone calls with people at the moment, just in case. So implications for data protection. There are implications in the context of the general data protection regulation. The implications come about in the context of the timelines and in the context of UK businesses, UK businesses doing business with the EU, both in terms of organization, businesses and organizations in mainland UK and at the risk of offending people. I will include Scotland and Wales in that purely uh, because that's the way things are at the moment. Uh, but Northern Ireland is almost a special case, given the fact it, is, it has a land border with the European Union, and there is a lot of cross-border trade. Um, and Tim is going to talk about the UK perspective. I'm going to talk about dealing with data processors in the UK if you're on the outside looking in, and we're going to look at the various scenarios that might exist if, a bre if the Brexit stops, if the UK goes for a Norwegian model, or if there's other models that might be adopted, what the implications are. And then Tim is also going to include a bit of a discussion about the Convention on Human Rights and Convention 108, which is the only international legal instrument specifically focusing on data privacy, um, which the UK is a signatory to, and there are implications around those areas as well that could impact on uh, the future of data protection in the UK. So in the context of GDPR, GDPR, as we know, is coming in on the 25th of May, 2018, about uh, 694, 693 days from now, including weekends and that long weekend you wanted to take in Tuscany. Um, so the clock is ticking on that. We're in the sunrise period during which organizations had to be getting ready and during which member state governments, which the United Kingdom still is, 
have to be implementing any local legislation that's required to give effect to the regulation or to give effect to any of the carve-outs that exist in the regulation. Things like the consent age for, for children for information age services, for example. Assuming that we get a leader of the Conservative Party, that there isn't a general election and that the mechanisms for initiating an Article 50 mechanism uh, are clarified, we can assume an October or November date for someone to press the big red button on the Article 50 and then we're looking at an October or November period in 2018 during which the, the exit would have occurred. So there is the distinct possibility that there will be a five to six month period during which the General Data Protection Regulation will be applicable to the United Kingdom as a member state of the European Union, which creates some interesting scenarios from a, a, a civil service and, and, and legislative drafting perspective that one team will be drafting the legislation for the exit, the other team will be drafting the legislation for the stuff they need to be doing as, as member states. And, and that's going to be complicated and Tim's going to talk a little bit about the potential implications around that. But it's important to know that there is this overlap. Um, timing is everything in comedy and referenda apparently. Tim's going to talk about this in a little bit more detail. Uh, it's the e-privacy directive consultation which ends next week. Uh, the public consultation window ends next week. Well, that's going to result potentially in changes to the e-privacy directive, potentially making it a regulation, potentially coming, in, uh, the target is to bring it into effect in the same time scale as the GDPR. And that's going to affect telecom sectors and online businesses, etc. And there's a risk that the UK will have no input into this, but will be affected by it. And, and Tim's going to talk about that a little bit later. In terms of the impact on EU businesses dealing with the UK and dealing with UK processors, and I've got the, the diagram here, the, the, the map here of Ireland and the UK, and the, or, the little orange bit up the top there, that's Northern Ireland, that's in the United Kingdom, and that is the longest land border between an EU member state and the United Kingdom. And there's a lot of trade from, like Dublin is there, it's, it's 60 less than 70 kilometers from Belfast, from, from the north of Ireland, from Newry. And again, I've gone to Belfast and Newry a lot uh, shopping. There's a lot of cross-border trade. Likewise, between Ireland and the rest of the UK, there's a lot of trade and a lot of sharing of data. Um, you walk down an Irish high street, for example, you will see a lot of UK high street names. So in terms of the implications, if you're a, an Irish organization that's using a UK-based hosting provider or partner, there's an implication here. And if you're a, a telecommunications provider, for example, that's using a UK data center to process your SMS messages, this creates a potential difficulty for you. If you have branches or subsidiaries of your business operating in the UK and Ireland, for example, a, a travel agency that's based in Dublin with subsidiaries in Belfast and London, well, there will be potential implications around the transfer of data about customers or staff between the different branches of your organization, depending on the status that the UK has from a data protection perspective. If you're using cloud-based solution providers, and when Safe Harbor fell, we did a lot of work in Castlebridge looking to find alternatives to common tools that were used by SMEs like MailChimp or SurveyMonkey. And we found a number of them in the UK for things like bulk emailing, bulk email management and email marketing and online surveys. But if they're based in the UK and you're using a UK-based service and you're in a different EU country and the UK has become a third country outside the European Union, there becomes some complications there potentially from a, a data transfer perspective. If you're a, a retailer with a UK parent company that's providing back office services like, I don't want to name them, but they're a catalog store where you can buy things um, beginning with A or other high street names uh, like some of the leading pharmacy ph pharmacies uh, and chemists um, or uh, electrical goods retailers 
that have Irish subsidiaries, Irish branches. And then the really nice one is if you are a loyalty card scheme operator operating in Ireland with your hosting and with the data being hosted in the UK. So a large retailer operating between the jurisdictions that operates a, an Irish loyalty card scheme, but for convenience and ease of setting it up, has all that data going to its, its main data centers and main data anal analytics teams in the UK. That becomes potentially problematic as well. Or if you're a Spanish-based airline with a UK-based parent that's doing central data processing. I'm not saying if these are any real organizations, heaven forfend there will be this level of complication in the way we process data across Europe because up until now we've been fairly certain that there was a reasonably common set of standards and the UK was in the club. So what are our options? What are the scenarios we're facing for each of these potential uh, types of organization? Well the good news is that there is always the option that Brexit will not happen. Uh, to paraphrase John Lennon, imagine there is no Brexit. If there is no Brexit, nothing changes. Common data protection regime exists. The United Kingdom remains in the European Union. It is subject to EU law. It is subject to the authority of the U European Court of Justice. It has a say in how that law is evolved and, in, and interpreted. And it has a seat at the table with the European Data Protection Supervisory Board. Um, so from the point of view of a, a, a another EU state, a company in another EU state sending data to the UK, there is no problem at all. It's really, really simple. Everything continues as it is today. The other scenario is, 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 when, is to go for a model like the European Economic Area. Um, where data protection is not dead, it's just pining for the fjords. In that context, the United Kingdom will have to implement data protection regime that is equivalent uh, as part of their engagement with the European Economic Area. Their, part of the EEA structure is to have equivalence in data protection laws. So Norway is having to look at how it will bring things up to the GDPR standard at the moment. And in this context, we're more or less going along as normal, but the little fly in the ointment is the Investigative Powers Bill that is currently before the House of Lords. Because the Investigative Powers Bill is quite likely incompatible with the European Court of Justice ruling in Digital Rights Ireland and is probably incompatible with the uh, European Court of Justice ruling in the Schrems case, given it, its, its emphasis on bulk collection of data and the, the, the standards of controls that are applied to that by the intelligence services and the level of judicial oversight and redress that individuals might have. And because that's there, that could actually impact on the ability of the United Kingdom to meet the standards required to be accepted into an EEA agreement from the perspective of data protection. Um, there may not be an adequacy decision available because of that, uh, which is why I suspect people are, are hammering home the importance of stalling that bill now and, and stopping it at the House of Lords level. But of course, GDPR compliance will still be required uh, in this context. So this scenario, GDPR still has to happen. And because of GDPR, standards, assuming no IP bill, everything can continue as it currently is today. Third option is another type of single market access model. And that would be something like the Swiss model or the, the EFTA model. Again, in, under these models, the UK would still have to comply with EU laws. Um, in that context, there would still be the adequacy standards that could be adduced for a, an EU country to an, a company operating in another EU member state to send data to the UK. But again, the IP bill rears its head here as a fly in the ointment in all of this. And um, it's, it's a significant challenge uh, that needs to be, needs to be recognized uh, in terms of the hurdles that the United Kingdom would need to jump through to meet the adequacy standards once they move out of the uh, European Union club 
And I know a lot of other commentators who have been writing about this recently, the last week or so, don't seem to have, have spotted that potential risk still on the horizon. But again, GDPR is still going to be a, a key issue here uh, for the UK. It's not going to go away. Option four. UK is completely outside the European Union and the European Economic Area. It is doing trade on the basis of a World Trade Organization framework, similar to the United States, in which case we will need to have a privacy brolly. Uh, yes, I've coined the term, steal it, use it. I want to see it trending on Twitter. Privacy brolly. Uh, this is where the UK would have to rely on uh, model clauses or an equivalent to privacy shield, uh, the privacy brolly, or some other form of adequacy assessment by the European Commission. But the investigative powers bill rears its head here again because of the, the, the challenges that it, it poses in terms of compatibility with European Union case law. Um, the Privacy Shield deal apparently is done and is being sent to member states for ratification uh, with the intent of having it in effect next week. Um, there's one leaked text that's out there, but I'm, I'm always wary about relying on leaked texts because they may not be the definitive text. Um, but we haven't yet seen the actual deal there. But what I have seen of the Privacy Shield deal, uh, it doesn't meet the standards of GDPR in my assessment. And I don't think it fully addresses the issues in Schrems either. So it's probably going to wind up back in front of the European Court of Justice. And any Privacy Brawley deal will fall into the same bucket, uh, potentially, again, because of other issues surrounding uh, the, the whole data management and data, data privacy regime that would need to, that would exist in the UK post a Brexit. But again, GDPR standards would still have to be applied to the privacy brawley because bear in mind, the privacy brawley cannot be negotiated until after the United Kingdom has left the European Union. It, they may start looking at privacy shield as a template for what a privacy brawley might look like and what it might need to do, but it, uh, it, they, they can't do anything formal on it, according to the European Trade Commissioner, uh, until uh, the exit has happened. And I think given that, G that the Privacy Shield is probably going to have to be renegotiated in light of GDPR anyway, uh, we may see an international agreement, a uh, framework agreement potentially coming out of the European Union to solve both problems. That would be an, a nice end game if we could get there, but I'm not sure if anyone has yet joined the dots to that level. So that's the end of my bit. Uh, Tim, would you like to take over? I need to give you control, uh, and then you can take over. I'll give you the keyboard a mess. So, Tim, you are now in control. Tim? Hello. Hi, Tim. You, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. You, you, you muted yourself. <laughs> you were being far. I, I, um, Go ahead. I did the thing of unplugging the microphone and plugging it back in. Again. <laughs> that seemed to work miracles. I didn't know the sort of thing you could do with IT. Maybe I should try that again in future. Anyway, um, so the, the perspective from um, the UK is obviously that we are in the first few weeks of a zombie apocalypse. Uh, there are riots in the streets, and um, we're, we're all stocking up on canned food and shotguns. Um, so it, 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 it's very difficult to know for certain. Um, the one, the one feeling I have that maybe we've we've missold this uh, webinar is we, we said we wouldn't do any uncertainty, and as Dara's already um, more or less uh, uh, outlined, there's a lot of uncertainty around. There are a lot of very straightforward things that we can all do um, to, to plan for what's uh, coming. So that's the that's the first thing that we need to look for. Um, now, oh, I can't. Oh, there we go. Uh, the thing that we need to think about more than anything is uh, that nobody knows anything. This is one of my favourite quotes about life. 
um, and that's the William Goldman, who's the screenwriter uh, of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and many other films. And he said of the motion picture industry, no one, nobody knows anything, not one person in the entire field knows for a certainty what's going to work every time out it's a guess, and if you're lucky an educated one. I certainly think that this now applies to um, the UK's relationship with other uh, jurisdictions in, in the same way that it definitely applies to the making of films. Uh, there are nevertheless some certainties that can be sought out. And, and, and it's identifying those, not wasting time on the uncertainties, identifying the things that are definitely going to happen, and any resource, any time that's going to be spent needs to be spent on those. Uh, just to illustrate the point that a lot of people still haven't quite adjusted uh, to the new reality, there was a, a statement from the uh, Information Commissioner, uh, the UK Information Commissioner, they said, if the UK is not part of the EU, then upcoming EU reforms to data protection law would not apply directly to the UK. If we could just highlight that immediate sentence there, um, the, the issue here is that the regulation does apply directly to the UK. Any business, as Dara's already explained, any business that trades with uh, EU citizens, any business that monitors EU citizens is subject to the regulation. Now, None of us are entirely certain how that's going to work now that we're outside, but that's clearly the intention. When the regulation was drafted, it wasn't drafted to capture UK companies. It was drafted with more US companies in mind, but that's the effect of the UK leaving the EU. So the, even the commissioner hasn't quite thought through uh, the implications. You could be forgiven uh, for making the odd mistake, given that they said this the day after um, the, uh, the the Brexit vote, but I was up at 4.30 writing blogs, uh, and I don't see why anybody else should be let off the hook in this situation. However, the other part of the, the uh, statement that I think is also uh, worth highlighting is the Commissioner's certainty that adequacy, that the implementation of GDPR in the UK is more or less the only option that's available. So in that situation, um, with with that clear view in the Commissioner's mind, um, one certainty that I think we can start to look at, in the UK at least, is that we cannot stay where we are. That although uh, Dan Hannan, who is an MEP, uh, very much a free, a free trader, a buccaneer, expecting us to sort of sail off into the North Atlantic and just be a free trading nation, he has mentioned opting out of the EU's data protection rules altogether. Apparently this will create an immense um, explosion of, of um, startups in, in uh, annoying areas of London. Uh, but um, I don't really think anybody else is seriously considering that. And certainly the commissioner, the, information, the UK Information Commissioner, has been plugging this idea for quite a time, every time doubt was raised, that we would have to meet the standard. However, I think things have moved on and we are a little bit more certain about the likelihood of that happening. So, uh, you know, they, as they say, here, uh, as I say here, um, the possibilities of the UK without the GDPR don't really bear thinking about. They, there will be businesses who will have to comply with the GDPR if they're selling products or services or monitoring EU residents. Um, if they're employing EU residents equally, they'll still have to comply. Um, there are also huge problems if you start to consider the position of Northern Ireland. Um, you have possibly a hard border being introduced, although that would be massively unpopular. You've got lots of cross-border employment issues. Obviously, as Dara's already mentioned, a lot of trade between uh, Northern Ireland and the Republic the, the, and businesses that span the border. You've, you're talking about an economy that is quite mixed and quite blended together. So the idea, purely on a practical basis, of these businesses juggling two different regimes doesn't seem realistic. Um, and I think that is the start of the certainty, that because so many UK businesses will have to comply already, the chances that um, we will try and go in the UK in a different direction are very limited indeed. Now, you can see how um, time has caught up with us, even in the last couple of days, how fluid things can be, uh, that uh, both Dara and myself thought that using a picture of 
Boris Johnson would somehow be um, a, a useful illustration in this context. Um, Boris has already exited, pursued by a bear and a lot of angry journalists, and even worse, Michael Heseltine, the, the lion-haired former uh, cabinet minister who has basically said that Johnson's career is over. We were thinking that our prime minister in this glorious new Brexit world would be Johnson. And merely by thinking that now Johnson is yesterday's news, it does illustrate that there's an enormous amount of fluidity. And if you wanted to be glass half empty, you could look at the range of uncertainties that we face. The UK now has a huge raft of EU laws. There are people within the Brexit camp who would very much like to strike a lot of them down. Um, we, we were very exercised during the, the Brexit campaign about the effect of EU legislation on our ability to buy bananas, uh, how many bananas we could buy and whether we could buy bendy ones. So it, it may be that the UK descends into a sort of corn laws situation of ensuring we can get the right bananas. Um, sorting out the GDPR in this amazing banana future may not be the highest priority. Um, there's also, and I have to say, a few weeks ago, this was, this was what my thinking was, that if we are exiting, even if there is a two-year window, there is always the possibility that um, the EU will not bother to issue infraction proceedings against us because we're going out of the door anyway. So will they even take the time? Before we get to that point, will the information commissioner, our information commissioner, will they actually enforce the regulation? Um, we don't have a commissioner at the moment. It's, it's chaos, I tell you. We don't even have an information commissioner because Chris Graham, the uh, previous incumbent, has departed, but Elizabeth Denham hasn't actually started work yet. So e even, even in data protection, the UK is sadly leaderless in this foreign and, and terrifying environment. But on the other hand, you could just be a bit more positive uh, uh, the alternative uh, to look at it from a glass half full perspective is that, in my opinion, David Cameron has effectively sorted out the question at least for inside the uh, the UK. Um, so oh, the uh, the issue here um, is that we, as Darius already pointed out, we will be members of the EU. Um, the possibility of us being members of the EU beyond um, the, the implementation of the GDPR is now certain. There were those who expected that Cameron would stick around, um, sort everything out, perhaps even begin the negotiations and trigger Article 50. He hasn't done that. It's not likely that his successor will want to do that either. One, the chief front runner has already said, uh, Theresa May, that she will do it when the time is right. Uh, Michael Gove, who is one of the other front runners, has said equally that you know, it's not something we want to rush into. Um, there are many legal commentators who don't believe Article 50 will ever be triggered. But even if that's unrealistic, there will be a lot of angry voters if that's the case. We are certain that the Data Protection Act is not adequate for any kind of trading relationship with the EU. Um, we will also have situations where those UK companies who do have to comply uh, because they have Irish or other EU customers or staff, they will be dealing with GDPR regulators, um, potentially not particularly unsympathetic uh, sympathetic ones. It's not hard to imagine Keneal or some of the other European legislators uh, deciding, uh, regulators deciding that what they will do is punish the awful Anglo-Saxons for their, their terrible repudiation of the happy data protection family by going after them in a big way. Why not? make an example of a UK company rather than a, um, a, a, an EU one. Now, in that landscape, the idea that the UK will, for six months, maybe a year, it, it's entirely realistic uh, that there will be a full year of the GDPR applying to the UK uh, before the negotiations end and we depart. So the idea that we will try and deal with that for a year and then go to something else when there will be so many other things going on. And more importantly, the, the current government, such as it is, is reasonably sympathetic to the, the aims and, and the final shape of the GDPR. I, my personal view, and uh, the recording of this, um, this webinar will, will be able to be used as evidence against me in the future, 
my personal view is by not sorting things out immediately, by not triggering Article 50 uh, now, and by making it certain it won't be triggered until October, what Cameron has done is ensured that the UK will implement the GDPR or something extremely close to the, the, the shape of the existing regulation. Now, the difficulty, the uncertainty, and, and you can't answer this question, is what does that mean for the UK's relationship with the EU? So if you're based solely within the UK, I think it's certain that we will get the regulation at the same time in the same way, and I think it's unlikely, in the, at least in the short term, that anyone will seek to um, water down the GDPR except in those carve-outs which are already supposed to be there and which um, some journalists have recently discovered uh, civil servants were already happily plugging away at. But by not triggering Article 50 immediately, there is now too big a window. There is too longer period of time when the GDPR will apply and I don't believe that there is any possibility that a few, uh, the government with all its other priorities will want to spend legislative time, uh, uh, civil servant resources, building something else, especially when you consider all the adequacy implications that are staring us in the face. So there is nevertheless, oh, if we just go back one, uh, there is nevertheless the, uh, uh, the possibility uh, the GDPR will now have to be implemented in full by a UK Parliament which uh, is stocked by people who um, can't stand each other, uh, much less the uh, opposition that they're supposed to not be able to stand. Um, so there are definitely some opportunities there, um, especially around the aforementioned carve-outs. There are quite large areas for exemption within the regulation anyway. And it's not hard to see that some of those opportunities may very well be taken up. Um, one thing that I am very interested in is the fact that the consistency mechanism, which for the UK would have ensured um, a lot more rigor in the application of the regulation than we've had with the application of the Data Protection Act. It's possible that if we're not part of the, the EU family, um, if we don't have the European Data Protection Board breathing down our necks, it might put that consistency mechanism in doubt. And I was looking forward to that because I'd like the UK Commissioner to have to fall into line with some of the other um, regulators. However, it's already been pointed out by a very respected um, law firm, um, 11 Kings Bench Walk, who represent the Commissioner frequently uh, in tribunal cases here, um, that that could well put adequacy uh, in doubt. Indeed, the UK courts may very well decide that um, without uh, interpreting the GDPR or our version of it consistently with the rest of Europe, uh, we will not be adequate. And however that adequacy is ultimately um, borne out, that's one of the ways in which we will demonstrate it. So another effect that might have been felt was that the Information Commissioner in the UK might have felt that they could make slightly different decisions than um, the rest of the, well, not the rest of the EU, the EU. I'll have to teach myself to stop talking about the rest of the EU. Um, but again, that adequacy problem still applies. So although these seem like quite big effects, um, distinguished legal minds are already suggesting that it will make sense for us to, um, to fall in line with the general drift of the GDPR's implementation. And third point, with the same uh, punchline, potentially some of the options kill off the ECJ as the ultimate decision maker on data protection law, but as Dara's already pointed out, not if we're in the EEA, um, and of course the UK courts may very well look at ECJ decisions as perhaps not binding, but definitely persuasive. I think the one area that that is likely to happen uh, is that those, the use of those exemptions. Um, we know in the UK that civil servants want to exploit the exemptions to allow a lot of interdepartment data sharing. Uh, there are already initiatives for um, much wider data sharing within government, and certainly the, the immediate loss of that pressure 
to to implement the regulation exactly the same as the uh, the EU. That will embolden some within the civil service, particularly in the in the cabinet office in the UK, where they are quite keen to free up data and exploit it. That will be uh, an interesting area. I think profiling within um, central government will be one of the areas where there'll be mo a bit the biggest attempt to soften the way the regulation is implemented. So moving on, um, one thing that I think won't change at all, I'm in fact certain that it won't change at all, is the observations that uh, Dara made about the, uh, the updates to the e-privacy directive. Um, technically, because we are no longer EU members, perhaps they might not apply, um, and we don't entirely know what changes there might be. But it's worth bearing in mind in the UK that what we are most concerned about as citizens are breaches of our implementation of the Privacy Directive, the Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations, which with great enthusiasm we always refer to as PECA. Um, lots of uh, opportunities for double entendres, which I will try to avoid. Uh, but um, if you look at the number of complaints uh, to the UK ICO, um, PECA complaints, complaints about nuisance calls, texts, uh, and emails, they dwarf the number of complaints. Uh, that are received about data protection. Indeed, if you add together all of the complaints about data protection, about FOI, um, they are still outnumbered by a factor of 100 to 1 by the complaints covered uh, by PECA, by email, text, phone, and so on. Um, there has been a massively larger number of monetary penalties, and even, even if you measure it by the tabloid coverage, there is massively more news interest in the Commissioner's enforcement against people who breach PECA than those who breach against data protection. And in fact, um, entirely outside of the Brexit debate, uh, there is a digital economy bill which was announced in the Queen's speech, a Queen's speech that was criticised as being uh, rather lacking in detail, rather lacking in legislation in anticipation of the Brexit vote. Um, in, in the digital economy bill, the government it was proposing uh, much tighter consent. Um, it, it's not certain how exactly that will work, but the need to do it, the pressure to do it, is undeniable, and the government are responding to it. You've even seen um, government ministers wanting to be associated with the Information Commissioner's activities on PECA enforcement, whereas under data protection that very rarely happens. So I don't want to be complacent about this, but I'm as certain as I can be that whatever happens with the e-privacy directive, not only will the UK not take this opportunity to soften PECA, that if there is any tightening, if there are any additional um, strict changes to the way in which um, the e-privacy directive applies, I am certain they'll be mirrored in the UK because of the public interest in this area. Because not not the, the highfalutin public interest, just people care about it. So I think PECA and the privacy directive in the UK are very safe uh, because there is just no appetite for softening those elements. Um, the one thing that I haven't heard anybody talk about very much um, is the crime directive, um, which comes into force slightly earlier than the, the regulation. Um, one has to assume that it's the same balance um, that will the uh, EU really take infraction proceedings against the UK if we don't properly implement the Crime Directive, given that we will be out of the door. I think here there is a very, a very strong likelihood that the way in which the Crime Directive, if it is implemented at all, the way in which that happens will be with the maximum flexibility. Um, data protection generally, and the regulation, are the responsibility of the Department of Culture, Media and Sport in the UK, whereas the directive has been given to the Home Office, and it is extremely likely that, that the Home Office will seek to implement any changes to data protection with the maximum possible flexibility, with the maximum possible exemptions. Now, I haven't thought this through with enough um, certainty to know what effect this might have on the, the wider um, uh, issue of the UK's relationship with the EU, but 
the Home Office would never have needed any encouragement to, um, to give police and criminal justice organisations the maximum possible wiggle room as far as data protection applies. And I think the Brexit vote will be felt very significantly in the way that we look at crime and justice issues here uh, and the cross-border implications of that. I don't think, I haven't seen any commentary about so far, but this is a green light, I suspect, to those in the Home Office who would like to give uh, a, a, a free hand to, to police and criminal justice. There are a couple of bumps in the road, whatever happens. Uh, on, the, on the left, we have um, Theresa May, who I've very ungallantly found the, the most embarrassing photograph uh, I could of her. Um, she is very likely to be our next Prime Minister. There is no certainty about what that means. Uh, May has a record as Home, as home Secretary of being very much on the side of law and order. The, I, the investigatory powers bill is very much a creature of the Home Office that she has run. Um, and so it's very difficult to know for certain what uh, her attitude will be uh, to the implementation of, of data protection. However, when I agreed to do this uh, webinar with Dara, uh, there was a, a clear fear within the uh, UK uh, human rights community that May's uh, becoming Prime Minister would signal moves against human rights because she has announced on numerous occasions her desire to repeal our Human Rights Act and more significantly to withdraw the UK from the European Convention on Human Rights altogether and replace it with uh, a British uh, equivalent. Uh, that has no relationship with the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, what's interesting about um, the, 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 the rapid pace with which our, uh, our, our politics are moving is that she's already ruled out any intention of pulling out of the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, which is something she's announced several times that she would like to do. So clearly, anything that has gone before can be wiped away. So when I thought of May, I, I, I feel really bad now for having picked such an, uh, an embarrassing picture of her because I now feel a lot more warm towards uh, towards May having having uh, conceded that uh, that decision. I don't know what she will represent, but certainly the immediate threat to the Human Rights Act and to the Human Rights Convention appears to have subsided in the need to be pragmatic. On the other hand, um, the lovely Max Schrems. I think we can expect to turn his attentions on the UK uh, with with huge enthusiasm, um, unless obviously he decides to go back and pursue his career as a lawyer and stop acting as the kind of the the, the, the uh, Europe's chief um, uh, data protection vandal. Um, the way I've always perceived Schrems is that he is the little boy in the Emperor's New Clothes story, and he constantly points out that the Emperor has no clothes on. Well, one of the potential solutions to the, 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 the mess that we've got ourselves into is the kind of uh, gentleman's agreement, the kind of uh, argument between uh, agreement between member states that even if the EU uh, the EU and the UK are separating there are certain agreements that we can come to certain arrangements that we'll all nod and wink to each other that definitely work rather like safe harbor um, Schrems won't let that happen and and Schrems will inspire other people to take a very clear look at anything and everything that is agreed so even if he moves on to um, other things or stays on the territory he's already on Schrems has shown what what one person with with you know with support from others but what a small number of people can do to any kind of nonsense now if you're a glasses half empty kind of person that means that some of the very pragmatic deals that might be done may be impossible. But at the same time, knowing that the EU and the UK cannot fudge the arrangements of the future on data protection because they will be tested by Schrems or someone like him, we may actually end up, although it will be a rocky journey, we may end up with a more robust conclusion because it will definitely be tested by other people. So I have to say, if you look at the issues of human rights and the, and the 108 Convention, it's tempting to view it as another looming catastrophe. Um, but 
I'm going to stick my neck out and say I don't think that there is a great risk to either the convention or to, uh, to Convention 108 or to the Convention on Human Rights. Um, the repeal of the Human Rights Act itself in the UK would would seriously damage data protection law. It would also massively undermine the Good Friday Agreement. There have already been very persuasive um, commentaries about the catastrophic effect of any attack on human rights, either UK's implementation of the convention or the convention itself. Um, and, and when I wrote this this uh, slide uh, earlier in the week, um, I've, I've written withdrawal from human rights convention floated by Team A. Not anymore. She's pulled back from that very convincingly. Um, so I think that the wider uh, effects of Brexit are likely to be that we're never going to do anything quite this daft again. Um, that the um, UK has dipped its toe in the water of massive constitutional change and quite a lot of people who voted for it are writing angry letters to the newspapers furious that what they perceived to be a protest vote against an unfeeling establishment has turned out to be exactly the thing that they voted for um, and there's a lot of buyer's remorse uh, floating around so I don't want to be too complacent but I think any further steps to uh, unpick our constitutional arrangements around privacy and human rights are very unlikely to happen. Um, we've got more than enough to be going along with as it is, but a lot of people probably uh, are already regretting the vote that they cast. They're not going to want to go any further. So to, to end hopefully on something uh, much more constructive uh, than some of the things I've already said, the priorities, certainly for UK data controllers, are, I think, very straightforward. Uh, the regulation builds on the foundations of the existing setup. So the regulation is being built on existing foundations. Um, while the final shape of our GDPR implementation is uncertain, it's very important that certain key areas are focused upon now. Uh, particularly consent. There are some very learned people, data protection experts, who have identified the consent part of the regulation as being significant and different. Um, that somehow um, the the requirement for unambiguous, freely given, informed consent is somehow a change from what we've had before. One one person in particular talked about the current arrangements being decaffeinated and the, the regulation being full strength. It's just worth looking at some of the enforcement that the Information Commissioner has done in the UK over the last year or so. A very substantial fine for an uh, online pharmacy who sold data without proper consent and two uh, pieces of enforcement. One, an enforcement notice preventing Optical Express from buying uh, data uh, with uh, dodgy consent attached to it, and a bigger uh, a, a, a monetary penalty against, ironically, the Leave.eu campaign for the same issue, for buying data without the proper consent. The Information Commissioner in the UK has happily enforced under a model of consent that is what the regulation requires. So any organization that is using consent needs to be certain that what it's doing is gathering consent with people's knowledge, with people's absolute positive affirmative agreement. And the idea that May 25th, 2018, or whatever the ultimate date for um, GDPR implementation in the UK might be, the idea that that represents a change in consent does not conform with the ICO's practice uh, at all. They are operating that level of consent now. They've always thought consent was that way, and they have merely started to apply that. Um, with fair processing, there's a lot of cr uh, criticism uh, uh, that I've read of the GDPR's approach to this, requiring long lists of information to be provided to data subjects. The only problem with that is the average fair processing notice, um, the average uh, privacy notice or, or privacy policy is filled with guff, is filled with twaddle that does not need to be there. So my very strong advice to anyone where, in, under whatever jurisdiction they're operating is to try what you might call a one-third diet, which is to take any information that you provide to data subjects 
and cut it down to a third of its current length without removing any of the meaningful information that people actually need to know. They probably don't need three paragraphs about how important all of this is to you. What they actually need to know is how your information, their information is going to be used by your organization. So I think complying with the requirements of the GDPR for a lot more information to be provided is quite easy once you allow your fair processing and, and, and privacy policies to be written by human beings rather than robots. Um, data processes, one of, the, one of the things that terrifies me about any data protection training that I do is that I will say to uh, the people who I'm with, you need to identify all the data processes because the, their, their faults, their problems can easily be reflected back to you. You can be held to account for their mistakes. The biggest data protection uh, monetary penalty in the UK is for an issue involving an errant processor. What terrifies me is the number of people who write this down as if it is new information. So a high priority for any data controller in UK or anywhere else is to track every data processor down to ensure that there is a contract in place with them. Now the last two points on my high priority list uh, are inextricably linked with our new commissioner. The, re the regulation requires data protection by design and it requires active impact assessments when data that's, that's risky is, is going to be processed. Now, the new commissioner in the UK, Elizabeth Denham, is Canadian. She comes from the land of privacy impact assessments. She comes from the culture that has probably more than any other jurisdiction advocated data protection by design. So any data controller within the UK especially, but obviously outside as well, needs to be looking at the areas of proactively complying rather than waiting and seeing for something to go wrong and then remembering you have a data protection officer who you've exiled to a, uh, a far corner of the organization. Medium priorities would certainly be um, the controls for processes themselves. Um, the, the, the regulation when it comes in will give data processes some responsibilities of their own, so they would clearly need to start looking at that. Um, it's also worth bearing in mind that the regulation introduces certification of, of data processing activities. The UK Commissioner has been very keen on certification for a very long period of time, and I doubt their enthusiasm will uh, abate. The things that I think are of the lowest priority for UK data controllers are the real innovations, the right to be forgotten, the mandatory data protection officer, the requirement for mandatory breach notification, and the terrifying uh, massive euro uh, penalties, which of course, because of the collapse of the pound, are now even more terrifying than they were before. Until we get a clear roadmap confirmation perhaps of my suspicion that um, we will implement the GDPR in the hopes of starting off the adequacy conversation on a positive note, I think these areas should not be as great a concern for certainly for UK data controllers. It has to be possible that somebody within government will try to exploit the uncertainty uh, within uh, that the whole uh, framework will try to um, carve out some areas for uh, a softening of the regulation. And if they were going to, it would almost certainly be these areas that they would look at, uh, particularly the requirement for a mandatory data protection officer and the very high penalties. So my very strong advice is to look at the fundamentals of the current arrangement that uh, flower in the regulation and to prioritize those. These final four items, innovations, they're the new house being built on the old foundations. And so I think they should be slightly lower priorities, uh, given that we definitely don't know for certain where everything's going. So I think handing back to Dara.
Sorry, uh, happy estate. I'm sorry, you missed me for a few minutes there. I, I, I'd muted myself. <laughs> um, okay, so happy estate. Know where your data is because you need to know from a risk perspective where your data is and what you're doing with it. Review your processor contracts. As Tim has said, a lot of people take this as new when we when I've had the same experience on training and consulting engagements for clients take this data processor agreement thing as a new thing and um, on, on that context you need to have those contracts in place and as a pro tip when you have the contract check the contact details the phone the contact phone number for the people you're dealing with to make sure that you know what jurisdiction they're actually in because we encountered this on a client engagement a while ago where a, a contract that said the data will be in the EU, the contact number for the, the DBA was actually in a non-EU country. It's also worth asking your processors, if you have processors in the UK, what their plan is for, for Brexit. Are they considering a, a, a plan from risk perspective? You need to start looking at your risks for compliance with GDPR, which you have to do anyway. And this is all stuff in terms of knowing where your data is, knowing your processor contracts, and all these things. These are all things you should be doing anyway. Medium priority. Start looking around for alternative suppliers for UK-based tools and services. This is exactly the advice I was giving people about Safe Harbor two years ago uh, when the Schrems case started. From a risk management perspective, you've got to have an idea of what your alternatives might be. And you need to assess the impact on your business continuity if you suddenly can't use a UK-based UK service provider for any reason. Uh, again, it's not that we're trying to, that there's, that there's certainty that something bad is going to happen, but there's lots of uncertainty, and therefore you need to start managing and planning for the risk. Finally, low priority. The low priority is actually doing something to make changes. Um, planning, do you need to change your suppliers? Do you need to change locations? Do you need to change contracts? Until we know a little bit more, there is no point in actually making a massive change. The, diff the difference to this is if you are not yet doing anything with a supplier in the UK, you need to be planning on the basis that something might change. And if you're coming from if you're coming to to the EU to do business and you're looking at UK partners it, it may be from a risk management perspective prudent to look at whether that UK partner has a subsidiary that is based in the EU and align your your business relationship with the EU based subsidiary at least for the next two years until we know what's going on um, again much like Tim I'm fairly confident that we, we won't get a full Brexit and there will be some sensible arrangement at the end of the day but there is still a, a lot to be tied up. So we're, we're, we're basically looking at a risk management process if you are a non-UK-based controller or processor. So uh, to conclude, and I'm going to unmute Tim again so he can make some closing remarks. Um, I think, Tim, you'd agree that where we stand is we're, we're kind of hanging on the zip wire waiting for someone to get us down. And we need to keep yes. and, and implement GDPR. I would definitely agree. I mean, it, as I say, it's this, it's the data protection uh, the arrangements we have at the moment are the foundations. We're going to build a new house on it, and we're going to want a roof because uh, it's going to rain. Exactly. Okay, everybody, we're a little bit over time because we had so much to cram into this. Um, so thank you very much. We got one question uh, about data governance. Um, are we seeing quiz, are we seeing businesses backing off from GDPR training or compliance programs? Or do you think GDPR, GDPR or not to GDPR uncertainty will damage sponsorship for more very necessary data governance or data protection work? Uh, excellent question. Um, I actually the, the the issue is not that we're seeing people back. But I'm not seeing people backing off from GDPR. I'm seeing people just starting to wake up to it. And I think in the context of Brexit, uh, it's just adding a, an additional complication. Tim, from the UK perspective, do you see Brexit causing people to back off? Um, I think it might cause people to be a little bit cautious about um, spending money, but to be honest, there doesn't seem, appear to be any appetite or any alternative for you know doing anything else. So certainly, if you look at my calendar, I mean, I don't want to look at this totally selfishly. People are still asking me. People are still um, asking me questions. It doesn't appear to have dented the certainty. There's such a a certainty that the GDPR is the only game in town. Yeah, obviously for the EU, but for the UK as well. I, I think it's going to continue in the way it has done because there isn't really an alternative.
Mm, I, I'd agree. And, and in the context of that we have 693 days to GDPR and we do not yet know how long it will be before there is an actual Brexit. Uh, in that context, focus on what we are certain about. GDPR is like death and taxes. They, they are the yeah. three certain things we have, death, taxes and GDPR. Everything else is up in the air. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your questions. We're six minutes over time. I'm going to release Tim back into the wild, and uh, the recording will be available for you all in the next few in the next few days. So you need to package it up and and and, and move it off this, the the platform it's on onto something uh, that's easier to get at. I'll also send in an email uh, in the next day or so uh, with some more information on Castlebridge and on Tim's company. We're not asking you to get in contact with us. We're just letting you know that we're there. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. I'd like to thank Tim for taking time out of his busy schedule to help put together the slides and contribute to the webinar. This is the first of a number of webinars that we are planning to run with Castlebridge, where we're going to have some invited speakers and experts from the different domains of information management to talk about different aspects of GDPR, Privacy Shield, Brexit, and information ethics. We look forward to you joining us on future webinars. And just remember, there are three things that are certain. death taxes and GDPR.